Hello, good morning and welcome. I think we've got a fair gathering of people that have that have signed in so far, still waiting on some latecomers by the look, um, but let's get started anyway. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us who have signed in already. Thank you to our panellists for taking time out of your day. That's much appreciated. Uh, thanks to Talos for joining us and a big thanks goes to our marketing team for pulling this all together. My name's Angus Strawn. I'm a Director of Business Services at BDO. I do a lot of work in tourist parks and resorts and tourism, leisure and hospitality, um, as you may see or have seen, um, but we work in with our National Tourism, Leisure and Hospitality team. So if you have any issues, you can use your phone audio and you can toggle in the control panel on your right. Everyone except panellists are going to be muted until question time at the end. The presentation that you can currently hopefully see on your screen um, will be in the presentation pane in the middle of that control panel and then you can type some questions into the chat pane just below. Um, please take note of the web address that's on the current sl slide Sorry, in case of any technical difficulties. Given that we're in a bit of a strange environment at the moment and a lot of people are joining us from home. I think that's about all the housekeeping I'm going to do. Uh, I imagine that you're probably all relatively well acquainted with where the facilities are. Um, about the day. So effectively what we're going to try and achieve today is give everyone a high level summary of using data to make decisions and manage performance. Uh, it's not about fancy acronyms like RPA and BI and AI and all those sorts of things. Um, this is about the basics of data management and uh, whether you're data ready. So you're going to hear from Talos Evans first in our digital services team about those basics of data management. We're then going to throw over to a panel discussion with Isaac Harris as well as Sarah and James Corbett from Reflections Holiday Parks and Summer Star Tourist Parks and I'm going to ask them some questions in a bit of a panel discussion about how they use data, how they make decisions using data, what some of the benefits of doing that are and you know, obviously what some of the pitfalls are. It does have a bit of a tourist park feel to the day uh, but this is equally applicable across a broad range of industry sectors. So Talos and I have worked in real estate, agribusiness, retail and the service industry in attempting to bring real time or as close to real time insights uh, to businesses to help them make decisions. Uh, a little bit about Talos. Talos, your first speaker, is the digital and improvement executive in our digital services team. Uh, a bit of a mouthful, so I actually went on to Talos's LinkedIn and I think he summarised it better. Uh, Talos talks about challenging the status quo, solving problems with data. Um, solving problems with data, the latter I can certainly attest to. Um, Talos has solved many of my problems over the years. Uh, but also challenging the status quo, I can equally attest to. I spoke to Talos earlier today about how long we've been working together. It's coming up 10 years and his comment was you actually had a full head of hair back then. So I think some of that's attributable to him and his uh, never, never ending challenging the status quo. Um, so I'm going to throw over to Talos now and he's going to talk to you a little bit about data management and the basics of data. Uh, well, thank you, Angus, um, and good morning, everyone. So I am Talos from our digital services team um, at BDO. Um, a, a bit of background around professionally what I do. So I'm a chartered accountant. I started my career in accounting. I now work across really three separate skill sets. So there's still very much the accounting skill set. There's also the data analytics skill set, which is really important. And then there's the web technology skill set. So in my team are accountants, designers, developers, um, BI specialists. Um, that's all very important when we think about data because those mix of skills are quite complementary. And fundamentally today, uh, I'm talking to you about three things like you can see on the slide, which is really where to start and, and what it means to be data ready and data fit in your business. Um, firstly, knowing your business. Secondly, knowing your audience. And thirdly, knowing your systems. And I'll, I'll explain why they're so important as well. Um, we're all at different maturities when it comes to how we use data in our businesses and in our organisations, and indeed in our personal lives as well. You know, you think about your phones tracking your fitness and, and looking at your heart rate and monitoring how many steps you do in a day. 
Um, those apps that are used in our personal lives are equally applicable in a business context. The design methodologies that they use, the technology that's used to um, produce the insights and how um, those, you know, what our major software companies go about um, curating the data in a way that's useful for decision making. Every business, I think, could look at these three, including ours, and better understand how data is used in their organisation and how it can be used moving forward. So if you're just starting out, or if you're quite mature in how you use data in your organisation, it's always good to stop and pause and to think about these three components. Um, today's not too much of a technical discussion. So, you know, when we get into the world of data analytics, let, let's be honest, it's complicated. Um, there's a lot of acronyms, there's a lot of um, jargon, there's a lot of skills that are needed to compile data at different levels. Um, if we're compiling data out of spreadsheets, it requires a skill set. If we go into you know, what we would call a full stack around databases and front end technologies and looking at what we call ETL flows, which is how we um, massage and transform data to make it ready for analysis, that of itself is quite technical and to be honest, quite organisation specific as well. So um, if I was to spend um, 15 minutes talking to you about technology only, um, I don't think you would get as much out of it as if we focus on these three key pillars that I think every business can really take something from. What we need to think about is when does management reporting stop in our organisation and data analytics start? Because at every level we would be doing management reporting. You know, we would be, um, if we're a retail business, we would be reconciling our point of sale system every day. You know, if we're a tourist park, we'd be looking at our booking rates. We'd be looking at who's coming in and who's going out. We'd be reporting that back to management or we'd be reporting it down to staff as well. So we'd be looking at the users of our organisation and we'd be thinking about what do they need to make valid decisions and more importantly, how can we inspire them in their journey and in their work as well? How can we motivate them? Um, and generally speaking, we would do that through, you know, pats on the back saying, hey, you've done really well. Um, the concept around how we use data is equally as valid in that context. When we think about data, you know, we often think about dashboards and, you know, internally I'm known as the, the dashboard guy in our organisation. Um, but it's not only about dashboards and, and we'll talk through exactly what that means. Finally, with systems as well, we'll talk about how your whole organisation, the technology that your whole organisation uses can help you get ready for data analysis. Because if you've got good structured data, if you've got well-engineered processes, if you're on software solutions that make it easy to connect in um, to data analytics platforms, to databases, to words like APIs, and that becomes a whole lot easier when we actually think technically about getting started. Finally, we will touch on some of the high level technologies and where you should invest most of your resources as an organisation. And I'll, I'll talk through the sorts of things that you can do in that technical landscape to really focus your time and, and resources. When we think about knowing our business, I often think about a retail sales example because it's the easiest to describe. So when we think about a sales agent, you know, ultimately what's, you know, what's, the, what's the main measure for them? The answer you would say may be commissions, you know, because ultimately they want commissions, they get paid a retainer and then there's a commission component to it. So if we only looked at the dollar commission, we would be assessing the measure, not necessarily the roadmap though that leads to that measure. And that's the first principle to really talk through is that roadmap and what that means. Because, you know, a sales agent would often start with cold calls. They would start with, um, you know, warm introductions maybe. They would have general conversations with people. Those general conversations would then lead to going out and appraising a property or appraising some sort of a, a product that needs to be sold. Looking at it, talking through the requirements of it. Then, you know, if they're a retail sales agent, they'd be listing the property and that's the next step. From listings, you get written sales, settled sales, so on and so forth. So if we think about this as an example, what would we look to track? Um, it's very easy to go into the, the deep dark dungeons of looking at many different measures, um, so much so that it may be confusing. So it's important when we do this that we think very clearly about up to five levers. I wouldn't do more than around five and say, well, if there are five roadmap indicators that lead to us um, uh, earning a commission, how do we firstly identify them and how do we measure them? And once we're very clear about that, it's going to help us hugely with data analysis. Because if, if we were looking at this and we say, well, retail sales, how are we going to provide data in a way that's useful for a retail sales agent? You could step through a process like this and say, well, we start at the cold calls and we end up with commissions, but it's a journey. And where we've got you know, seepage in that journey, we want to know about that. Where we, where we may be falling over, we want to know about that as well. Because listings may be very, very strong and things may be falling over at written sales, for instance, because there's just not the interest in the property stock or what have you. 
um, it helps us to better clarify exactly where in our organisation there are pitfalls. If we think about another example around tourist accommodation, let's have a look at what a tourist accommodation revenue roadmap may be. You know, that concept of the roadmap, which talks through these different stages. If we think about revenue from tourist stays, you know, we're an accommodation business, what are the factors that may influence that revenue from accommodation stays? Um, unlike a retail sales agent, I would suggest it's not as linear. You know, it doesn't start at a cold call and end up at a commission. It's a little bit more intertwined. It's a little bit more dynamic in how it works. So firstly, we have inventory. You know, we have our forward bookings. We, we want to know what's coming up in the pipeline because it's perishable. You know, we can't sell last night's accommodation tonight. You know, it's, it's gone. So we've got to fill up a, a we've got to fill up that inventory, those forward bookings. And then there's then there's an intertwined relationship between our occupancy rates, you know, our daily rates, um, rev par, so ultimately what we're earning from each unit of accommodation, um, as well as looking at things like how our guests find us to begin with. So how are they how are they hearing about us through the various channels, you know, through online mechanisms? How are they hearing about us through our website, through our socials? Um, there's various elements that are at play here. But if you look at something like this and say, well, one of the key factors for our business is going to be driving accommodation revenue to understand, well, what is it we need to see to know how to better achieve accommodation revenue? I would suggest we start with this concept of a roadmap, which is up to five measures, thinking about the frequency we want to track them and thinking about ultimately how that's going to help our decision making um, leading to ultimately the goal of accommodation revenue in this example. We have a tool out there called Parky, um, and today's not talking exclusively about Parky, but I'm cutting to it just for a few illustrative examples to show you what I mean. Um, this slide that I'm about to click play on and you'll see how it works is a slide that looks at this week. So you can see here those handful of measures that we've just been through are now illustrated in a, well, this is a dashboard that doesn't just show the measures, but also shows the comparison to last year. Because if we just put up metrics around, say, 24 bookings for powered sites here, it's not as relevant because there's nothing to compare it to. So is that 24 a good, bad, indifferent or otherwise? Uh, we can see, well, last year, for this same week last year, we had 44 bookings. So that helps us put into context exactly how our booking performance is going. When we look at what's happening from a pipeline perspective, and you know, as accommodation businesses, we're looking at filling that pipeline, you know, perishable inventory. Um, we've got metrics that look like this, and I'll just hit play on this so you can see it. What we're looking at here is the guest arrival date. So we're looking at over the and into the future, how is our um, how are our bookings faring relative to last year? So it's taking that metric around forward bookings, which was one of those five roadmap items we've identified, and saying, well, if we want to make that comparable to last year, but it's looking at a future many months. How would we display that from a visualization perspective? And you can see how it works here across the various accommodation types. What's interesting about this now is that it's incorporating a couple of those principles. So we, we firstly needed to define what those measures were. And once we defined what the measures were and how they related to our ultimate goal around accommodation income, we could then design the interface for this. I would suggest if we hadn't done that homework around what are those five key metrics and why are they so important for a tourist park business, the outcomes wouldn't look as clear as this. They would perhaps be more cluttered. There would perhaps be more measures on the screen. And that, that thinking around what are we trying to track and why may not lead to an outcome that is as easy to interpret as this. And by the way, this is an iterative process. So these three pillars that we're talking about around knowing your business, knowing your users, and knowing your systems is just as relevant for us as it is for everyone else. And Parky and our digital products continually have this lens applied to them around, are they relevant? Are they tracking the right measures? Do we have our roadmap thought through about what we're looking to track and what the influences of that roadmap are? And if we're at all unsure, uh, we make sure that we firstly seek clarification and feedback and input. And secondly, we make the changes as we need to. It's very much an iterative process. So the idea of using data in your business is, isn't a project you start and finish and it's done. It's very much something that is live and dynamic in your organisation over time. Secondly, when we think about knowing your audience, what does this mean? And it's most relevant in tourist parks, but relevant across all businesses as well. 
And that is, if you're reporting to a board, you know, if there's a board or there's senior stakeholders in your organisation or there's owners of the business and you're in an operational role, how can data help you? I'd suggest probably the dashboard approach isn't the right approach there. Um, they're looking for what we call curated insights. So a board is looking for someone to have done the hard work, to have produced the analysis, to have used the dashboards and the data, but not to show them everything because they only care about what they need to know. You know looking at um, the KPIs of the organisation, they're looking at the strategic plan, they're looking at tracking to targets in the strategic plan. They're looking at risks and they're looking at um, what they need to do to better manage risk in their organisation. So a board isn't going to go on a fact-finding mission um, that say operational staff or even senior staff will in, in an organisation. They're looking for prepared analysis. And so the format that we would deliver data to them is quite different to the way we would deliver data to operational staff. Housekeepers in the organisation, for instance, and, and staff that are, have operational roles, you know, particularly out in the field type roles, they need insights on the go. It's got to be dynamic. It's got to be easily accessible across various devices. So when you think about how you might surface content to them, dashboards may or may not be the right answer there as well. It may be alerts, it may be text messages, it may be systems that enable them to see what's happening only when bad things are happening. So it's exception-based reporting, where we don't just say, here's all of the information you could possibly want. We think through and we say, well, they're a housekeeper. So they'll want to know four or five metrics, or they're working in an operational field capacity, they'll want to know other sorts of measures on a more dynamic real-time basis, but perhaps not all the time as well. Then you get people in your organisation, perhaps your management reporting team, perhaps a management accounting team, if you're large enough, perhaps a data team as well. And they're probably not going to be interested in dashboards either. They're going to want the raw data. So they're going to want you know, databases effectively. Um, so what does that mean? So how do you cater to their needs and giving them you know, access to the raw lines of, um, of transactions, as well as curating things in the dashboard that say, you know, your senior management will be interested in looking at, so they've got a, a near real time snapshot of their business because they want to do the analysis. They, they're not necessarily able to go trawling through all the raw data, but they're not quite at the level of the board where they, they're looking for the curated strategic insights. You know, they, they do want that operational control. So the buzzword there is around democratising data and how do we, through online platforms, dashboards and the like, how do we provide senior leadership in the organisation with the right mix of giving them the critical insights in a curated fashion, while at the same time giving them access to the more detailed um, metrics within their organisation that they can drill into. Uh, and if many of you have searched for accommodation yourselves, it's, it's, best, um, it's best highlighted you know, through searches online when you book accommodation, you know, through your OTAs and the like. Um, we know that the number of filters that you're likely to apply grow every year. So, you know, even flights before COVID and accommodation and tourism has been great for it, you know. I'd like to stay in these places, but I'd like to stay in a place that has a pool, but I'd like to stay in a place that's within this price range, within this travel distance to, you know, a destination that's got these characteristics, that's got a fireplace, that's got Wi-Fi. So before you know it, you're applying a lot of filters on your search. So your basic search is, I'd like, a, I'd like to stay somewhere for the night. You know, I'm on a holiday. But before you've finished, you've probably applied seven or eight filters. That concept also applies when it comes to dashboard design. In that, you know, that one metric, let's say around occupancy rates, can be cut many different ways when we think about which location, which time period, which category type, um, there's many metrics that can be, or filters that can be applied to that measure, so that one measure being occupancy can be transformed many times through filters. So it's thinking about all of those things. It's thinking about how you're going to motivate and inspire your users so that they ultimately can do what it is you'd like them to do, and that is make informed decisions in their roles. I'll show you this, which is a function that's still in beta within Parky. Um, we've only released it in the last couple of weeks. It allows users to schedule email alerts. So um, part of the feedback we've been receiving is, is around just that, you know, that we've got a, a, a really detailed tool in Parky, lots of dashboards, but what we don't have is the snapshot. You know, it, you need to log in and you need to interrogate it and you need to spend time interacting with it to get value out of it. So how can we do this differently? So we've come up with this feature here, which allows you to schedule an email notification and it will only notify you as an alert when things go wrong. Or you can schedule it as a digest. I'll show you another example, which is a leaderboard style. And so this is a leaderboard in uh, one of our real estate tools. 
and it's designed to go on a TV screen in the office. Um, so it's another form of dashboard, but TV screens are a great way to circulate information. Um, and when you're in a competitive environment around real estate sales as well, um, there's nothing like being top of the ladder. Um, and so one of the things that we heard from um, clients that were in the residential real estate space was, wouldn't it be great if we could just put something up on the TV that updates all the time, every couple of hours, and provides agents with their own insights as a, as a way to helpfully motivate them um, and see where they're tracking. And see, you know, if, if particularly you're a young up and coming agent and you want to know, well, what does it mean to be successful in this industry? It's very open and transparent. Um, what it means to be successful. So that's another delivery format. So there's dashboards, there's reports, there's emails, there's TV screens, there's SMS alerts. Um, what ultimately you use as a delivery format for your insights largely depends on who in your organisation you're looking to influence. It sounds pretty logical and straightforward, um, but it's actually hard to do. Like if you think about it, we go back to step one, which was around knowing your business. So we need to think about that roadmap to what are the five key indicators that are really going to determine our signs of life as a business. Secondly, we apply this lens around who's actually using this data and what is it do they need to see. You know, we start getting we start getting perhaps many metrics and we perhaps get many users. And then it becomes, well, who's most important at what points? How often do they need to see it? And what are the insights drilling down further that they may want to see into the future? Thirdly, we come to this question of know your systems. And this is um, really key because it's the, it's the step right before we actually start getting into the weeds of data analytics itself. Um, if you've got, a, if you've got a, a great system that let's face it is largely cloudy these days, but not exclusively. Um, if you're a larger organization and you've got lots of on-prem infrastructure, on-premises servers and the like, um, there's no reason why they can't be used for data analytics either. But what's important is that they're accessible of course they're secure, um, and that the data is structured in a logical way that's going to give you what it is that you need. So if you're using disparate systems, you know, different systems as part of the cloud ecosystem, are they all talking to each other? And if they're not talking to each other, when do you use one and not the other? What's the source of truth for the metric that needs to be accessed and how easy is it to get into that system? Um, are you using those systems to its fullest potential as well? You know, so um, for instance, uh, if you've got housekeepers, are you using housekeeping modules to track um, staff cleaning times, to track staff performance, um, to look at efficiencies that can be gained? Um, if you're using asset registers, you know, are you regularly checking um, your asset registers and finding out when was the last time X piece of machinery was repaired and is it on a maintenance schedule and are there gaps in, you know, a bit of a Gantt chart style of when things need to happen? Um, that requires the data to be entered in the first place. It requires you to have confidence in your systems and it requires you to be using the full feature set of those systems in a way that makes logical sense. And why is all of that so important? Because finally, if we think about what it means to get started with data analytics, my strong advice is to focus on the foundations. And what I mean by foundations is think about where you're storing your data and how you're using it for analysis and try and future-proof that as much as you can through making it as flexible as you can. The biggest thing you can do to start if you're just starting out is to move your data out of spreadsheets into some form of a database structure. And that's hard. And it means you're probably not going to be able to achieve as much in the short term as you otherwise would be able to. Because you could take a spreadsheet, plug it into a BI tool, create a dashboard, Bob's your uncle. However, if you do that, you'll forever be doing that. You won't be automating the process. And if you don't automate the process, it means you'll forever need to be doing it manually, which over time will take time. It will mean it's not scalable. So if you then want to introduce new measures and value enrich your data through new sources, you'll then have to find you know, ways to hack that solution in a way that works. And you'll end up with uh, you know, a BI tool drawing from four or five different spreadsheets, for instance, um, in a way that isn't very sustainable or, or, or replicable across your organization. If you focus on the foundations around where's your data structured, in what format is it structured, how can you best use it and enable others to use it? Um, difficult conversations, expensive conversations, uh, but very necessary for your organisation to really move forward with data in a way that is automated as well. Because part of the reason why we're doing data analysis as opposed to management accounting and management reporting is so we get the benefits of near real-time information, automation, accuracy, everything else that stems from it. And that all starts with having data in a structured format. 
If you're curious about why I've got a petrol pump here, um, it's because you probably heard the analogy that um, data is the new oil of business, and, and that's very true. And if we think about how we look at data as a commodity, its storage and its cleanliness and how we access it, thinking that through will set your organisation up for success over the long term. So thanks everyone for listening to me. Um, that's a quick snapshot. Um, I'm now going to hand back to Angus, who will introduce our panel and um, start the start the panel conversation. Thanks everyone for your time. Um, and thank you, Talos, for those insights. Really great. Uh, and you've done well to keep that to 20 minutes. Um, so thank you very much. I guess what I take out of that, maybe I've taken my own five signs of life out of that, but uh, number one, what are your five key signs of life? A data management is a live and dynamic project. Think about who needs to be influenced. What are the deliverables and how do you deliver it and how do you cater for different audiences? Um, and focus on the foundations because data is the new oil of business. That is a nice segue into our next session, which is a panel discussion. So if I can ask James, Sarah and Isaac to bring themselves up on screen. Um, James and Sarah Corbett are general managers of the Summer Star Tourist Parks Group in WA. Uh, they're also from a corporate restructuring background and have over the last five years or so come back into what is at its roots a family business, but a reasonably large family business and a, and a very successful family business. I've had the pleasure of working with James, Sarah and the family over the last 18 months. Um, and the reason they're here today is because their focus on data and managing performance and improving themselves and their business um, in, in my mind has been exemplary. Uh, Isaac Harris uh, is the financial controller at uh, Reflections Holiday Parks or executive manager of finance at Reflections Holiday Parks. Sorry, Isaac. Um, Reflections Holiday Parks, for those who aren't aware, have got 37 parks up and down the east coast of New South Wales. So un under their remit or under their control in some beautiful locations. James, I wanna start with you. Firstly, I did promise you a chance to give your business a plug, so I'm gonna be true to my word. Um, you too have some beautiful parks up and down the coast in WA and inland. Um, so can you please tell us a little bit about Summer Star Tourist Parks to start with, but then if you could also tell us or let us know what your key data sources are and how you manage and use this data to help you guys make decisions. Sure, thanks Angus. Um, yeah, so Summer Star Tourist Parks uh, was started by uh, Sarah's parents um, 24 years ago. They purchased a small park in Esperance Bay, um, down in Esperance, um, and since then have used a reinvestment strategy to um, acquire more parks, and now Summer Star operates 11 parks in WA. Um, we have about 150, uh, 150 staff working across um, those parks, and I guess our mission statement is sort of family-friendly, affordable accommodation options um, in unique locations in Western Australia. Um, so. We're spread across, I think, about 2,400 kilometres, so quite a large footprint in WA. Um, and, and because of these distances, I guess, uh, we rely heavily on sort of readily available um, data to drive decisions from a strategic standpoint. Um, and to do that, we utilise a number of cloud-based systems, um, which really are uh, the backbone of our business. Um, so we use RMS as our front office platform. Um, and recently have moved from Myob to Xero uh, as our accounting software. So they're really our two main sources. Obviously, RMS is, is um, looking at occupancy and, and um, rates and managing, managing our booking charts. Um, and uh, obviously, the accounting side comes through from, um, from Xero. Uh, on top of that, we use a number of um, uh, other data sources, we use Google Analytics for our um, soft performance metrics, we use OTAs to get review scores, booking data and competitive sets. Um, so, so pulling all this together, I guess these decisions that these data sources support um, a whole range of um, decisions from large, large scale park acquisitions, um, just down to day to day uh, performance metrics, such as looking at cleaning times, um, for for housekeepers or or cost comparisons um, against one type of accommodation 
um, category across multiple parks. So um, data not only, I guess, supports these decisions that we make, but it also highlights the need that we need to make one. Very good. Good summary. Um, and yeah, I guess pulling pulling data into one spot being key, particularly with such a geographically diverse business. Um, Isaac, similarly, um, can you tell us a little bit about Reflections Holiday Parks to start with? You've got some sensational locations and businesses. Um, can you also then follow up and tell us a little bit about how you capture data and what data you capture as well, similar to James? Um, and then I'd actually be interested in from you because I know you've got a bit of a data management background as well. Um, what data do you find useful and what's a waste of time? Sure, so no pressure. <laughs> Just um, a few questions there. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, so as you said earlier, we have 37 locations. Uh, we are New South Wales based and that's largely due to our, I suppose, our ownership structure. Um, at this point in time, uh, we, as you said, we have 37 locations. Those locations are largely on the coast, but we do have uh, 10 inland, which are based around inland waterways or dams or lakes, uh, which are a bit of a different format. We still operate them as holiday parks, but they provide a bit of a different, um, uh, I suppose, a bit of a different experience, let's say. Um, and obviously along with that different experience comes different customer demographics. So um, customer demographics and insights within our business uh, primarily, I suppose the greatest opportunity we have is to be able to collect that information from NewBook, which we, we very much do. Um, along with NewBook, we use CBA um, daily insights, which I believe uh, BDO do work with CBA to, to develop that platform. So on that note, I would encourage anybody who is listening to make sure you have an open relationship with your with your financial institution. They're not just there to, to facilitate the financial payments for your business. They do potentially have some of these benefits. Now, we use CBA. I'm not sure what, <coughs> excuse me, the other financial institutions are doing, um, but I would most certainly recommend that you do seek out that information. And if it's available, attempt to utilize it. Uh, because it's there and quite often it's free, which is the best thing. Not that I want to encourage people not to use Angus's <laughs> services, um, but uh, the information's there. So um, make sure- Nothing beats a freebie it. though. <laughs> this is true. Um, yeah, I, am, I, I, mean, I think CBA <laughs> are a little bit ahead of the curve there as far as their data platforms and technology they've invested in and those sorts of things. But you're right. Um, you might just have to press those other banks if you're with other banks a bit harder to get to um, get to the right person to find some data um, on your business or on your industry or, or whatever it is. Um, but CBA through their daily insights, or daily IQ platform are, are a fair way ahead. Yep. Uh, we also use Roy, Roy Morgan. Um, so we have periodic, um, I suppose, periodic surveys um, and reports from Roy Morgan for us to be able to ascertain exactly what customer demographics are utilising which parks. We do have, as I said, 37 locations and each one of those parks has a slightly different customer demographic. Um, so that's also a really helpful piece of information because that helps you set your pricing um, and helps you with your marketing strategies. It, it's really valuable information. And a lot of those Helix personas, the information that comes out of those reports, if you have your information system set up correctly to collect the right data at the right stages in the booking, you can nearly get that information, particularly you can nearly get that information for free. Uh, particularly if you have the daily insights from CBA, which is what we use, that provides a really good basis. And CBA have 25%. I sound like I'm advertising CBA, but <laughs> there's no inducement here. I do have to say that. Um, it just, it, the usefulness of the information that that is provided through a platform such as that um, does really help um, help us make those decisions. Um, Google Analytics is something that we also use, but I do have to say prior to um, prior to Parky, it wasn't something that we readily accessed. Um, it was really a point in time for us to make decisions around budgets and marketing strategies that we would access that, that information. So um, that really covers off on our customer demographics and, and, and insights in terms of the information systems that we use, but financial and revenue insights, um, we use um, STR benchmarking, BDO benchmarking, as well as OTA insights um, uh, on an ongoing basis. So uh, 
that gives a pretty good summary of what, what information systems we use. In terms of what I find challenging or what we find uh, to be a waste of time is really inaccurate information. It's all well and good to have the, the um, to have your information systems, but your information systems need to hold accurate data. There's no there's no value in information in a system that that isn't accurate. At the end of the day, you need to know who your customers are. If you don't know who your customers are, then it's really hard to build a business and a sustainable business in that regard. Very good, some great points, absolutely agree. So demographics, OTA insights, financial institution, all valuable sources of information, um, naturally a, a discussion around benchmarking. Benchmarking's an interesting thing. Benchmarking's not a right or wrong answer. It's about understanding where you stand in the overall scheme of things and understanding where you might stand in comparison to your competitors. So um, I have a lot of people that come to us and say, hey, can you do a benchmarking assignment for us and let us know if we're better or worse. You're not better or worse, you just might be different. It's about understanding those differences um, and, and taking advantage of them. Sarah, so we've heard a lot of great points from James and Isaac. I'm going to throw you in the deep end now. Um, I know you have a very analytical background as well um, and a very people, people management focused in your role. Um, can you let us know who the key people are in your business that have access to data and why they have access to it? Um, can you also just let us know um, what challenges you have around security or what controls you've got in place? Yeah, sure. So. I suppose I want to reiterate what Tala said, regardless of whether you give it to them intentionally or not, everyone in your business has access to data about your business. So when you think about it, your office workers know how many check-ins are coming in every day, your housekeepers know how many cleans they're doing. Um, for our housekeepers, they know what times they're allocated for those cleans. So they've got, they've got data, whether it's meaningful in that format is another question, but they've got it. So I suppose what we have done recently with the help of Parky is, um, consolidate that data so that it can be used in a useful manner. Um, I was a bit trepidatious when we first started this process about opening up our systems to give our staff access to data, but on discussions a bit with Angus and a bit with our team, realised that giving people data is like giving them the, the steering wheel. They've got a direction to point and they know where they're trying to go. So we now have rolled out the Parky system across um, across our parts in our team and regional management. So they've got different cuts of data, all of the different levels, but they've all got access to it. They can see their budgets, they can see prior year performance, they can see their forward booking charts, um, all of these really useful metrics that help them manage our parts and manage our properties. It also helps them feel like they've got ownership and something to aim for. We were getting a lot before we provided this data how do we know if we're doing a good job? Are you guys happy with our performance? And that's kind of the last thing you want to hear from your staff because it means that they don't know where you're trying to end up and they can't help you get there. Um, but it's, it's interesting to me since we started this parky process, the more data we seem to be giving people um, in sort of snapshot measures, the, the more they're getting on board with our goals. Um, we rolled out a new um, rostering and timekeeping system called Tanda for our housekeeping, which ties in with our RMS database and RMS housekeeping module, um, which we find fantastic. And it's been interesting to see the girls in the housekeeping teams kind of rise to the challenge of what their goals are and how they can hit them. So from every kind of level of the business, people are aiming, aiming to hit the targets. So um, it is a new kind of new proposition for Summerstar, um, providing these budgets and forecasts and um, different levels of data. But so far we've had nothing but success with it. I still have, I still have, um, I'm still cautious about who we let access our data and I am actually really pleased that we, and again, this is not a plug for Parky, but I am pleased that we <laughs> use Parky. Oh, thanks, all <laughs> taken. <laughs> <laughs> but it means that people aren't printing off data out of our POS and they're not trying to get lists of invoices and produce data that is, is not a complete picture. So at least we're giving them the full story and empowering them to use the data correctly. It's the relevancy yeah. of the data yeah. that they're getting as well. With, with Parky, you can actually strip out what is not relevant at each level. Yeah. So what they're looking at is really sort of timely and relevant data, which we're all working towards the same goal. We're all trying to go in the same direction, but just you know, yeah. giving what they need helps them do that and gets everyone aligned. Absolutely, yes, and, and obviously all plugs appreciated, but plugs to one side, um, I think it's it's about 
Um, it's about trying to empower the people that are below you, either in management roles or um, some sort of supervisory roles, and sometimes even just you know, the, the people that are at the front counter um, to understand where you're going and, and how you think you might be getting there. Um, so I guess with, without providing them data uh, to help them in their roles, it's a little bit like tying their hands behind their back, blindfolding them and, and saying off you go. So um, certainly, certainly understand that perspective. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, I will stick with James and Sarah for now and I'll let you guys decide who answers this question. Um, maybe it can be both of you. Um, but it's fair to say that SMEs, even SMEs of your size, are resource constrained at times. Um, what challenges do you face with finite time and resources in the access, analysis and the use of data? Well, I, I guess anyway, you time is very important, it's precious and, and we never have enough of it. So um, having spent a lot of time in my um, previous life looking at business intelligence tools and trying to build them myself, um, that was my full time job. So um, trying to then do that yourself and trying to pull um, relevant data from each each place um, and we've mentioned a number of sources um, take a lot of time I, I started off when I first came into the, the family business at Summerstar um, building a, a dashboard which only had I think five um, key performance metrics on it and a number of um, soft metrics and that took I think three four days a month just to to build it and by the time I built it and we had all the the end of month done and then we we had all the information to then build it it was it was too late to make any sort of relevant um and timely decisions so um, the next it, one yeah exactly yeah so <laughs> it, it's about you know it is about time um and what we're trying to do is is get that information as quickly as possible and make decisions that are informed so we need the data behind it to be relevant and accurate um but also we need it quickly um and you know, we just we in the modern day, we start off a Monday morning looking, and we use Parky because it does pull that information into one place. But um, that's that's the first port of call. It, it, we look at we look at fires. What where are the fires burning straight away? What's what's screaming at us in this data? Where do we need to focus to put out those spot fires for the for the next week or the next month? I also think you've got to make time to prioritise using your data. So it's all very well to have it, but you need to look at it in how it can define your strategic objectives and how you can respond to your data because we all think well from an operational perspective you think you know something but if the data doesn't back it up then the thing that you know is not right um, and you need to challenge yourself continually and not just think oh, i've got a tool i'll put it in the back burner or look at your little green line and think oh that's that's enough you've got to really drill down and understand it because data is only as useful as the amount of work you're willing to put into it as well Absolutely, that mindset's great, Sarah. Um, I was going to ask the same question to Isaac, but we're running a little short on time. Um, for those that do want to ask questions, um, we'll be hanging around for 10 or 15 minutes or so um, after the end of the session in a couple of minutes um, to answer questions. Um, so those who want to stay on, feel free to stay on. Those who want to drop off um, at a uh, 11.45 our time, um, obviously feel free to drop off. One final question. Um, so I'm gonna pose this to all of our panelists and just let them all jump in at the same time, see who goes first. Um, what are your three best tips for business owners who want to use multiple data sources across various platforms to help them make decisions and drive business performance? I'm going to start with a really simple one and then I'll leave it to the guys, but um, <laughs> look at what systems you're using to start with and how you can simplify and clean them up. When we first started with Summerstar, we had 11 different databases with RMS and RMS worked with us to create one database. That piece of work then meant we could only had to log on to one system to find the data. So it, it, there's no, um, no magic in that. It's just looking at cleaning data, simplifying it and getting it down to its um, most convenient way of accessing it. So yeah, I think you have everyone looks at multiple sources for making strategic decisions, but um, generally you'll find that there are some key pieces of information within that um, in that particular source. Um, trying to look at everything in in all those um, I guess data sources would just be overwhelming, and, and often you wouldn't be able to see uh, the forest from the trees. So um, 
you need to understand the particular piece of information and it may well just come down to a simple um, X over Y metric that you're trying to drill down to, to get to. You need to understand um, what those two pieces of information are. Um, I guess having a, an off the shelf solution, um, someone's already worked out how to pull those particular sources. Um, so, so definitely look at that um, and it'll save you a lot of time and it will just make it so clear to interpret um, what those decisions need to be based on those, those bits and pieces of data that you're, you're trying to look at. Very good. Have we got you, Isaac? I'm back. Back. Well done. Um, top, uh, top three tips. Top tip, maybe. One to three. Give us a tip. Tip range. One to three. All right. Um, so my first would be to know your customers inside and out. Um, at the end of the day, the customers provide you with a vast amount of information for nothing, purely because they want to be able to pay you and come and stay and use your facilities, no matter which business you're in. Um, uh, customer trends in terms of their purchasing habits, uh, as well as their repeat business, and therefore the link in link to customer profitability in particular. Um, I have a varied background, as, as yourself and Talis do. Um, and when I was um, in the waste industry, we used to use customer profitability, profitability to decide on which customer segments we were going to or which in customer industries we were going to target because we knew that we weren't going to go to the fast food because their bins are heavy. We don't want those. We want the light bins because that's where the profitability and the margins are in the end the information systems available, sorry, the information's of, the information available um, through your information systems is no different in, in the holiday park industry, which is where, where I'm at now. Um, and linking to what James and Sarah said, know, know your systems um, and find the right information partners. There's various sources out there and we've spoken about quite a few uh, of them today. Um, the vast majority of information will come from your systems internally to your business, um, but there are very good sources um, externally. And the third would be knowing how to um, consolidate um, all of those information systems, because until you consolidate them, you will get value from your systems um, if they are disparate, but you will get far greater value if you can bring your finance system together, your your revenue management system together, as well as any other information you can possibly do to add value to that um, to that overall larger data set. Um, and we obviously use Parky um, to do this. Uh, we do have the skill sets to build a platform such as this within our business, but what we are very short on is time. We don't have time. We're not a big uh, we're not a big back office team. Uh, we turn over fifty million dollars in thirty-seven locations. Like that provides a lot of a lot of day-to-day -day for us to manage. Um, so and that's why we went for we went for Parky. Um, it's that ongoing. Uh, I think Talis was saying it's the ongoing maintenance and upkeep, um, and that's really that's where the value is, as well as the development opportunities. And we do work fairly closely with with Angus and Talis to to get the the outcomes that that we that we do need. Awesome. Thanks, Isaac, for those insights. And, and I guess thank you, panel. I'm going to ask you to stay on because you might be better at answering some of these great questions we've got coming through than, than I am. So um, if you can stay there um, while we work through a few questions. Um, I'm going to work through the questions that came to us first via the registration process. Um, and then we'll work through the ones that we're getting at the moment. So firstly, from Sandy. Sandy has asked us, and this is very much a panel question. Um, obviously the data we provide can help you when you're setting your rates, uh, but I'm going to ask Isaac to start with, what factors do you need to take into account when you're setting your rates? You, I suppose there's a couple of factors that you're considering when you're setting the tariff rates. Um, the, the, I suppose the factors that are, that are being considered when we set our tariff rates are not only industry considerations, uh, but customer demographics, as well as the overall park, um, the park infrastructure itself. Um, those three really work together. And then also what's on offering in the region. Um, if you have a park that's in a fairly remote location, there isn't really much else going on there and it's fairly run down, it's not going to have um, its tariff rates aren't going to be anywhere near as high as a park that's in a remote location, doesn't have much around, and you just invested $6 million into, into a new park development, bringing in new cabins and infrastructure. 
Um, so it, it's it's a fairly broad, I wish there was an easy answer to what your tariff rates need to be, but um, unfortunately not. It's always, there's always competing factors. Um, yeah, and and I know people. there's a couple of um, revenue managers who might be able to answer that question as well on, on the call too. Um, but, um, you know, we can we can certainly circulate some contacts for Sandy around um, after today if, if you're interested, Sandy, and if you're listening. Um, James and Sarah setting rates, the million dollar question or thereabouts. Well, I, yeah. yeah, return on investment, um, competitive set, all the sort of things that we you talk about from a like an analytic perspective are all right. Um, there's a our business is still small enough that we still get a bit of it from customer feedback. Or if you, the last thing you want to hear is, "Oh, you're cheap. You're the cheapest one we've been to." That's a pretty good indicator <laughs> that you're probably not at the right price point. Yeah. Um, but it comes back to what Talis was saying with know your business. What, what are you trying to aim for first? You, I mean, you can look at a ton of com competitive sets. You can look at external sources. What are you aiming for? Um, and then know your audience. So if, you, if you're, what, you know, we're trying to be affordable. So what is affordability today? And what is affordability in Perth versus affordability in the Pilbara in Northern um, Western Australia? They're two completely different things. Um, and know, know your audience. So if, are you going for the workers? Are you going for young families? Are you going for the grey nomads? Um, are you going for international tourists? They all have different price points, right? So you need to, I guess, understand which one of them you're aiming for and then use those external sources. Um, you know, Parky does pull in industry comparisons on pricing, but you've also got OTAs that do competitive sets. Um, so hopefully there's enough data in town to give you an idea of, of where you need to sit. Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, the next one I can answer very quickly and easily uh, from Rick. Do you use NewBook to gather your figures for analysis? Yes, we do. NewBook's one of our integration partners um, together with a number of other cloud-based systems and, and other bigger ERPs where necessary. But um, yeah, NewBook um, provides us data through an API, um, as does RMS. Uh, who, who are the other major um, property management systems in Australia, as you've heard from James and Sarah, and they've been uh, very supportive of us on our on our journey. Um, we also integrate with CECOM out of New Zealand as well um, from a property management system perspective. Uh, I'm just gonna get to a few questions from the crowd. Um, so, Alison, is the Parky Cloud dashboard a customized dashboard for accommodation or is it a Microsoft BI portal dashboard? Um, tell us, are you still there? I'm still here. I'm just turning my webcam well on now. Cool. Are you able just to give us a quick minute or two answer on what is Parky um, as far as customization options? Yeah, sure. So um, in its early stages, Parky was a range of uh, purpose-built dashboards, I guess. We had a series of templates that we rolled out for every for every subscriber. We're moving it more to what we call a SaaS-based model now. So it's largely going the way of more custom code than it is BI tools. That's for a couple of reasons. It gives us more customizability. It allows us to work across many devices as well. So, you know, when you're looking at a dashboard, it's hard for that dashboard to render properly on every screen on every device. If we build it in code, we can do that to a greater you know, degree of accuracy. Um, it lets us uh, be more extensible as well. So um, we've got a roadmap of features that we're looking to introduce into Parky, um, many of which do require an element of custom software development. So um, BI tools, and I think where you're going is it like a Power BI product? Um, we use Tableau, which is a version of Power BI. It's, it's a similar sort of a thing, um, but more so it is a purpose-built custom product. Um, within that, if there are uh, additional features or unique requirements that you've got, we can look at how we may be able to insert those as part of an overall sort of parking arrangement. Um, but generally speaking, it is, it's, a, it's a SaaS subscription product um, that we work on to continually improve and iterate over time. Um, with quite an aggressive roadmap, certainly over the next six months of things that we're hoping to roll out. Awesome, thank you. Tell us, question from David, have you explored using location intelligence to understand where your clients come from? Uh, so yes, to a degree, um, obviously there is the guest location. Uh, there are some rules around that, um, being the GDPR rules that have come in um, relatively recently and collecting personal information. So. 
where we can, we steer clear of collecting personal information like addresses and phone numbers and email addresses and that sort of stuff from your customers. We definitely steer clear of that, um, but we do collect postcode data and we analyse postcode data. Um, so recently we've released some, some statistics out via the national body and also via um, various press organisations around um, you know, COVID and, and the impact it's had on the industry. Um, and what we're seeing is that more and more people are holidaying in their own states. Um, so, and that's coming obviously through natural border lockdowns, but even when the borders were slightly released, um, people were a bit too, a bit too scared to venture too far from home, I think, just in case, you know, borders did get locked down again. So, um, we do collect postcode data. Uh, I guess, tell us, I don't know if there's anything else. I think you disappeared. Maybe if you want to come back again, um, if there's anything else you want to add to that. Uh, no, not really. I mean, so so yeah. So um, from a demographics perspective, postcode data is really the only thing we collect. Um, we probably won't really look to collect guest demographic data beyond postcodes in the short term. It does get a bit tricky when it comes to you know collecting identifiable information for guests that we try and steer clear of. Very good. Um, so this, which I think is our final question. So we're, we've only run 11 minutes over, so that's really well done, guys. Um, but I think this is our final question from Thomas. And I reckon I actually know who this might be, but anyway, we'll leave that one. Uh, is there any special deals with property management system providers that are available at the moment? So yes, there is um, to sign up to Parky uh, without trying to be too blatantly salesy. Um, RMS, uh, one of our integration partners, are offering a great deal um, in, in partnership with us. So uh, for any any new people signing up, they get free onboarding. Uh, they do not pay an API access fee from RMS, which would otherwise be payable, and there's some special rates available. Um, so that's available through to the end of September, obviously in light of the current situation and COVID and data being more important than ever um, is the sense that we're getting coming out of the general business community. Um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible and bring down a few of the barriers to entry around entry cost and setup costs and that sort of stuff. Um, so thank you for the question, Thomas. Uh, and I don't believe there's any others. Um, that's all. Uh, so. Thank you very much for our panellists. You've been uh, shown your business insights, uh, obviously for James and Sarah, who are coming through as the second generation of a family business and are taking over the reins of operations and running the entire business. I know um, from discussions with the first generation that you guys are taking this business to the next level um, and doing a great job. Isaac, uh, obviously through through feedback we've had and, and board um, board discussions we've had over the years around the various different projects we've done in your parks. We can see that you, you're doing an exceptional job there as well in improving those parks and growing revenue and growing the bottom line. Tell us, thank you for your insights as always um, and well done on keeping it to time. Thank you everyone and have a great day. We'll see you soon, I hope. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.